All right, welcome to the first day of level one models. Um, by level one, I'm referring to the modeling of the fMRI or BOLD time course. BOLD stands for blood oxygen level dependent signal. And I'll probably talk more about that later. Today, we're gonna to talk about the canonical hemodynamic response function or HRF. So make sure you're ready for this. You have to be completely familiar with the GLM and the assumptions of the GLM and additionally, you should be comfortable with the matrix form of the general linear model. If not, please go back and revisit simple linear regression or multiple linear regression or both. So what's our point? What's the whole point? What are we trying to do when we do an, uh, a time series analysis of a brain of data? So just as a reminder, we're using a voxel-wise approach or a mass univariate approach meaning we analyze each time series one at a time. When I talk about thresholding maps, we'll see how the spatial smoothness gets brought back in, um, depending on how you do that step. Anyhow, here we have a block task. This could be a flashing checkerboard, so checkerboards on, off, and our goal is to find bold time courses that look like this. The thing is, if you find these bold time courses, they don't look exactly like our expected uh, response, which is in green. So the green is when our stimulus was on and off, so that's the expected response, and the blue is the actual bold signal. And this is actually a very strong, strongly active voxel. So there are different properties about the signal that we're going to study. The one we're going to focus on today is the fact that the stimulus starts here, but we don't see a bold response until about five to six seconds later. So there's a delay of this response. Here's a voxel without signal, so you can see it's just noisy. And on another day, we're going to talk about the drift. So you can see this has this downhill drift, and then it swoops down here again. So we'll talk about that in a couple of more days. But today we're going to focus on this delay of the signal. So recall the general linear model. Um, in previous mini lectures, these were either things like reaction time or bold activation estimates within subject. But now we're focusing on the single subject. So this is a bold time course. So this will be a time series. And these will be various regressors that are expected bold responses, like that green line I just showed you, for various stimuli that were occurring during your task. So the name of the game, what we're going to be doing over the next few lectures is focusing on this t-statistic and how it changes as we improve our model. And for the most part, we're going to do a few things that change the numerator, which is our estimated, estimate of the magnitude. So today actually is the, probably one of the bigger things we're going to do that changes the magnitude estimate. Otherwise, we're going to focus on the residual variance, or here the residual uh, um, standard deviation. So, and then this chunk here, I refer to this as the variance uh, contribution from the design matrix. This will stay fixed because once your data are collected, there's not much you can do about this chunk of your t-statistic. There's not much you can do here. Um, the changes we're going to make, at least to the design matrix, don't impact this chunk very much. They could change the numerator by quite a bit, uh, but most of the action is going to be in this residual variance. Because if we have a big residual, we're going to have a big variance, and then our t-statistic will be small, which is bad. So we want to make our t-stats as big as we can. All right. Again, today we're going to focus on this delay of the bold response. And we'll talk about this drift another day. And this is just, I'm just showing you the same thing I showed earlier, but the little boxes at the bottom are indicating when the stimuli occurred. So here is the simplest model. So what I did was I took the expected bold response, which is, it was green before, now it's pink. So if you tilt your head 90 degrees to the right, this is just that time series. So this is just the time series rotated. So here's the bold time course rotated and the expected bold response. So that is our dependent and independent variable. And this is the model we're gonna run. So here's the actual model fit, um, not good. So the pink is the y hat, the blue is the y. So if I want to um, visualize the residual, I can do that by shading in the region between my y and my y hat. 
So the yellow here corresponds to this sigma hat term, which I've underlined in yellow to show that. Um, the numerator, the point 3, that corresponds to the height of this estimated bold response shown in pink here. And this green is just the, as I said before, it's the variance contribution from the design matrix. As we'll see, this doesn't change much. So even for this voxel, we have a pretty good T statistic to start. 3.55 is pretty big, but you can tell by visualizing this that the uh, fit is, it could definitely be improved. So let's talk about the bold signal a little bit more. So we can treat the bold signal as a linear time invariant system. So basically it describes how the neuronal signal, the thing that we're actually interested in, isn't what we're measuring. We're measuring the neuronal signal after it's been filtered through the blood flow response. The thing we're measuring is actually in the blood. It's the oxygen um, uh, concentration. So, right. We use this assumption then to help us get from the thing we wanted to what we're actually measuring. And under this assumption, uh, we can use an operation called convolution to help us make that jump from the neuronal signal, which will look like our boxcar back here, or this is at least what we expect kind of the neuron to do, be on and off, on and off. And we can apply a convolution to get the expected bold signal. So what does linear time invariant mean? So LTI. So linearity means the resulting signal from two stimuli occurring close to each other is the same as the sum of the individual responses. I'll show an illustration in a second. Uh, also means the neuronal signal with twice the magnitude results in a bold signal that's twice as large. So this is true within reason. Um, obviously, if you think of maybe a visual stimulus, you make it uh, twice as... Uh, but make the contrast twice as big. That could increase your bold signal by two, twofold. But um, obviously, if you make it 100 times larger, um, the bold signal won't increase 100 times or else, I don't know, blood would shoot out the back of your head or something. So within reason, this holds. Invariant means it doesn't matter when it happens in time, the response is just shifted. So here are the examples. So linear, um, we have an isolated stimulus with height of 1 and an isolated stimulus with a height of 2. The expected bold response, and these were uh, constructed using convolution with the hemodynamic response function, which I'll talk about in a second, but the expected bold response for the stimulus that's twice as large is twice as big. This is showing how the signals build. So two stimuli by each other. If you do the convolution for each individual stimulus, which is what's shown in green, to get the expected bold response, you just sum those up. So two stimuli close together right here will have a bold response that's twice as large as a single isolated stimulus. So that's linear time invariant. Um, this is just a study that studied this with actual data. They looked at one trial by itself, two trials in a row, and three trials in a row, and then they differenced these um, different response functions uh, in the, from the, the bold data. And the differences look like this, which is showing that what you need to add to two trials uh, bold response to get the three trial expected bold response looks a lot like the one trial. And likewise, to go from one to two, you just sum two single trials. All right, so how do we do this? Well, we use an HRF, or hemodynamic response function. The most common one we use is the double gamma. So it's two gamma functions. The first one gives us the probably what we're most interested in, that's this peak here. And the model uh, modulates uh, basically the height of this. That's what we focus on measuring, is the magnitude of the bold response. And then this post-stimulus undershoot has been uh, seen in lots of different imaging data sets, so um, it's good if your HRF has a post-stimulus undershoot. That's what the second gamma does. So an isolated stimulus like this is expected to have a bold response that looks like this. And the convolution is the operation that we use to combine our canonical HRF and our expected neural response. So HRF on the left, neural response on the right. So you can think of the convolution operation as a way of blending two functions together.
Uh, it's used in a lot of different ways in imaging. It's uh, used to smooth data sets frequently as well. So here's the, the math for it. H is my HRF, F is my expected neural time course. I would like to figure out what it is at time point T. So basically what you do is you take the summation of your HRF at some lag times your uh, neural response at that lag and you sum it up and add it together. I'll have a picture in a second. So what this part is, if you wanna visualize this, you just take your HRF and flip it around backwards. That does T minus M. And then you put your expected neural response next to it and then the summation, or actually at, for a specific time T, you move this flipped HRF on top of your, um, actually pick a point T here. So let's say I put a line here and then you scoot this over and you multiply the two together and add them up and that'll give you this. So I have an illustration, let's see if this works. Right, so this is from Wikipedia. So the two functions are shown and then, so this is the HRF scooting over the neural response. It's a bad HRF, right? Because it's a box. And this black time course or function that results is the convolution. And so you can see the area corresponds to the height of the convolution. And this dotted line corresponds to T. Okay, well, hopefully that helped. So you can go to Wikipedia and just sit and stare at these for a while and it'll help give you, it builds your intuition. And they have a couple of different looking functions. Okay. So the end result is this. So here is our expected neural response. The green is our hemodynamic response function. Or I'm sorry, the green is the um, expected bulb response. There are different HRFs. There's a Gaussian, which um, you typically aren't going to use for fMRI data because it's not symmetric. This is the one from FSL. You can see it's not completely symmetric, so I don't know what's going on with it. I've never used it. I think for some populations, I hear babies do not have a hemodynamic response function that looks a lot like adults, so you do have to use different modeling strategies for them. Oh, also, if you're working with something like a breath hold task, the hemodynamic response is different for that. So sometimes people use that uh, breath hold task to um, adjust for blood flow differences. Um, it's like a poor, poor man's, no, it's not a, it's a type of hypercapnia. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into that. Um, so we're just talking about standard task fMRI here. So here's the gamma. Um, I believe this is still the, def the one that comes up in FSL, but everyone that I know uses the double gamma. It's the default in SPM. And again, you want to use it because of this post-stimulus undershoot. So the convolution is actually done in a finer time resolution. Um, this is just important for you to know if you ever generate your own regressors or if you're simulating data, you will want to take this into consideration. And the reason is because, say you have, I'm going to show an example where the TR is three, which I don't know, present day is kind of long. It wasn't that long, 2004. But, um, for a while ago. The idea is any trial occurring at any point during the period of your TR will look exactly the same in the model unless you use a finer time resolution to do the convolution operation. So here's an example. On the left is the, a time resolution of 0.1 and they have four different stimuli ranging in duration. So this one is three seconds long, this one's two seconds long, this one's one second long, but they all start at zero and onset. This one here is just scooted over, but it's the same duration as this blue. So these all look very different when I do the convolution in a time resolution of 0.1. And then what you do to create your regressors is you then um, sample this at the resolution of your TR and you get the yellow, red, blue, and cyan time courses shown here. On the other hand, if I just used a three second time resolution to do my convolution, all four of those stimuli would look like the, the dotted black line because there's no way if I'm stuck in a three second time domain to differentiate onset times within that three second period or, on, or uh, trial durations that vary within that duration. So in order to model your data better, you use a finer time resolution. 
All right, enough of that. Let's make a design matrix and see how improved the fit is compared to the first fit we looked at. Here it is, much better. So the pink is the Y hat again, and the, the cyan is the Y, and the yellow is the residual. So before our T statistic was around three, and now it's up to nine. So two things happen to cause that increase. One is the yellow shaded region or the residual variance, it decreased quite a bit. Also, now that we're adjusting for the fact that the um, actual response is shifted in time, um, our model is able to capture the true peak of the response much better. So the numerator also increased as the activation magnitude increased. Um, this, even though we changed the design matrix by using a convolved regressor instead, stayed about the same. And we're going to see this is the case for all the changes. This chunk of variance due to the design matrix stays about the same. So just a quick comparison of the two. I don't know why the colors are different, but the red is the expected bold response. The blue is the true bold response. So you can see that the yellow, the residual, is much improved here. Next time we'll talk about how to take care of this drift. Make sure you have all that. Um, make sure you know the canonical HRF that's most commonly used because you will have to choose that when you model your data. And make sure you understand the assumptions you're making when using a canonical HRF. That's it. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.